Welcome everybody and thank you for attending the MRC Wednesday webinars. Today's topic is crossing the chasm, making one click and recurring payments work in LATAM, presented by D Local. I'm Josh Dwight, a US program manager with the Merchant Risk Council. I will be today's moderator. So feel free to submit questions and I will ask them at the end of the presentation and as time permits. Before we begin today's great webinar, I will provide a short overview of the MRC. The Merchant Risk Council is a nonprofit trade association for e-commerce fraud and payments professionals. The MRC was established in 2000 by a group of merchant leaders who shared a goal of optimizing e-commerce payments while strengthening fraud and risk management activities. The MRC has grown and currently supports over 560 member organizations across 30 countries around the world. There are many great resources that you will find, including previous recordings of Wednesday webinars, white papers, community forums, and many more at merchantriskcouncil.org. Without further ado, our presenter today is Michelle Golfold, the VP of Growth at DLocal, who is here to discuss payments in the Latin American regions. So, Michelle? Thank you, Josh uh, and MRC for hosting us today. It's always a pleasure to share some of our insights with the MRC community. Uh, my name is Michelle, Elite Growth for DLocal, and today we're going to be talking about recurring payments in Latin America. Speaking about LATAM, uh, I'm originally from Uruguay, a small and beautiful country, uh, currently based out of San Francisco, and still peacefully enjoying the sheltering place order over here. Uh, probably many of you are in the same situation. For those of you in the audience that are not familiar with eLocal, uh, we are a 360 payments platform focused on connecting international companies with their users in emerging markets, both by doing pay-ins, meaning collecting money in local currency, and payouts, disbursing money in local currency. We are a team of around 250 people, HQ in Montevideo, Uruguay, and with offices in the US, UK, Israel, Brazil, China, and a few more. Currently, we process payments in 21 markets. Uh, that means being truly local uh, for 21 currencies. A quick overview of today's agenda. First, we're gonna define the two main recording models uh, that we're gonna be talking about. Then we're gonna touch on card payments, understanding how this works uh, and where are the key aspects we need to consider. And after that, we're going to speak about alternative payment methods. Uh, in Latin America, cash is predominant, as, as probably uh, many of you know. Um, and some other trends are emerging. So we need to get ready in order to fully leverage uh, this reality. So let's start with the two uh, predominant models. Uh, the first one, one-click payments, meaning storing the customer's card and, and using it for further orders without having to ask for it again. Amazon is a great example of this model, uh, also called customer initiated transaction. And the model on the right hand side of the screen is subscription. Netflix is a good example here. You basically, as a user, put your card the first time and hopefully you don't have to touch it ever again. Uh, you'll just get automatically charged every month. That's a merchant initiated transaction. Now, unlike in, unlike in the US or Europe where the financial infrastructure is pretty robust, uh, particularly for car payments, in LATAM, uh, we need to be very careful with our payment strategy because in some cases the infrastructure might be a little outdated. So we need to be prepared if we want to optimize conversions and reduce churn. We'll explain how this actually translates into specific actions uh, later on this presentation. Let's move on to card payments. There are two very powerful features that you will want to explore. The first one is save cards, uh, also known as storing, vaulting, tokenizing the cards. Users will put their card on the first transaction and then after <clears throat> storing it successfully, 
uh, we don't have to ask for the card details again. Obviously, there are a few uh, rules you'll need to follow in order to store the card, such as following PCI DSS policies, for instance, never storing a CVV other than in memory for when a transaction is still alive. Um, and in some cases, for extra security on a recurring transaction, meaning a transaction that is not the first one, merchants may ask for the CUV or expiration date to verify the, call, the card holder or even increase the conversion rate. Um, you may want to reconsider doing this too often if you're looking for the perfect uh, frictionless checkout process. The second feature here is billing. Uh, who controls billing? Is it the merchant? Is it the PSP? Is it some third-party billing solution like Zora or Recurly? Each model will have some, some pros and some cons. Um, and also, what's the billing strategy? If a user sign up on May 20th, are we going to be charging them uh, every 20th uh, or the first day of the month? Uh, we'll expand on this later in this presentation as well. Let's go over a few topics that make uh, LATAM pretty unique when it comes to managing payments. First, Latin America is a huge region, uh, so we can't really assume that what's true for Brazil also applies in Colombia. We need to fully understand the specifics for each country uh, and each payment method. In some cases, uh, 3DS will be mandatory. Uh, dynamic descriptors won't be available or even performing a $0 authorization will be impossible. We also need to do some research with local data to determine billing days and times. We will need to have uh, more than one acquirer whenever that's possible. Again, because the infrastructure might be uh, not fully reliable uh, by using local acquirers, obviously. Uh, then we're gonna discuss if uh, account updaters are available in Latin America, uh, is it enough if I offer just credit cards? Uh, just a hint, no. Uh, and lastly, are Google or Apple Pay any relevant in this region? And let's try to uh, start to answer some of these questions. The first one about 3DS, uh, it's important to know that it's mandatory for debit cards in Brazil which represents a huge portion of the card market. Now, with the famous liability shift, issuers will tend to become more conservative with their fraud rules, so authorization rates uh, will most likely go down. Is there an option to operate debit in Brazil without 3DS? Uh, the answer is yes, but only for big merchants. Uh, and in an issuer by issuer approval basis. 3DS is also used in Colombia, uh, in Mexico, but it's not so predominant. And in countries like Argentina, it doesn't even exist. User, users uh, don't really know it and are definitely not used to it. Installments. Uh, between 30 to 50% of e-commerce transactions in Latin America are paid using installments. So this is huge. This means uh, splitting the payment into smaller monthly equal payments. This also typically means having an interest rate uh, that could be either assumed by the consumer uh, or the merchant. For instance, in Mexico, uh, they call it meses sin intereses. That means interest-free installments. Uh, but it's tricky because actually, uh, usually prices will get inflated to account for this. So there's, there might still be an interest um, or a different flavor to it. Parcelado uh, Loja in Brazil, that's basically the merchant controlling the interest uh, and they can even create a revenue stream out of it. They can add a markup to it. Let's uh, continue with uh, number three. Uh, zero dollar authorization and dual message availability. We are 2020, but there's still no dual message capability in Colombia. Uh, or in Chile, for instance, a redirection is required to do it. Now, the pretty useful zero dollar off is not so useful in Latin because it will just get rejected. Uh, instead, there's typically a small amount in local currency which will be used to verify cards. 
uh, you need to make sure to communicate this to your users properly if you want to avoid surprises. And lastly, going back to debit cards, as we said, they are huge in Brazil and they're starting to get popularity for e-commerce in, in Chile uh, and, and in other places in, in Latin America. Uh, and in Chile in particular, the only available solution to process debit cards locally today requires a redirection, meaning adding friction to the process. However, it's still key and relevant to include them in the payment mix uh, as they're extremely popular. And hopefully uh, 2020 will be the year uh, for debit to get support without in any redirections in Chile. Moving on, uh, using local data means, for instance, understanding paydays. In Mexico, in Colombia, or in Chile, getting paid every 15 days is quite common. Uh, so you want to make sure you wait until uh, they got paid to trigger their subscription renewal. Also, sending renewal batches in the middle of the night will usually work, except for the cases where acquirers perform maintenance tasks. Uh, so taking that into consideration is also key. Uh, also, the logic to to optimize uh, conversion in a in a renewal setup, where recycling before the subscription uh, expires is key something like sending the renewal uh, five, three, two, one days before the expiration date to make sure the service will uh, continue to be provided. Now, what does this fancy diagram really mean? Essentially, uh, making sure we are connected either directly or through a PSP to multiple acquirers in each market. Why? to be able to chain transactions or be able to route dynamically based on bins. Uh, for example, this is quite common in Brazil where there are multiple acquirers and routing all the Santander transactions through GetNet, uh, just for the fact that Santander owns GetNet or all the Itaú cards through Regi uh, because of the same reason, might actually uh, optimize conversions uh, and also by having redundancy, you get prepared for unexpected downtimes. Things you want to consider when choosing your model, either going cross-border or with local acquirers. Uh, in some cases, cross-border processing may be cheaper compared to processing locally. That's uh, true in, in, in some countries in Latin America. But you're actually leaving out millions of consumers that have local only cards, uh, debit cards, or just cards from local schemes such as Elo in Brazil or Naranja in Argentina, uh, that if you are processing with an international acquirer uh, in a cross-border fashion, you won't be able to reach them. Also, uh, FX management here is key. When a transaction is originated in US dollars and lands into a Brazilian issuing bank, FX fees could be high and unexpected for consumers. Processing locally uh, means setting up local entities in each market. The answer is not necessarily. You could still use local payment facilitators without having uh, to set up local entities in each of uh, these markets. For those of you who are not familiar with account updater, it simply means uh, automatically requesting updates to the issuers for uh, vaulted or saved cards in the event that this card expired or got replaced. Uh, now, is this feature uh, available in Latin America? The answer is still very early days. Some issuers are starting to support it such as Santander, Elo, Itaú, Bradesco, and a few others. Uh, but compared to uh, other regions, uh, Latin America is still a few steps behind. So going back to debit and prepaid cards, uh, we already talked about Brazil and Chile a little bit. Um, countries like Colombia, where most of the debit cards uh, don't have a CVV or an expiration date, they are 
planning on actually uh, replacing these cards so that they can be used online. This plan is uh, led by the main banks, Man Colombia and the Vivienda, and it's expected to fully replace all plastics uh, within the next two years. Yes, it's a lot of time, uh, but we'll get there eventually. New prepaid cards are popping every day in Latin America, uh, either with challenger banks uh, like New Bank or Wala, or companies becoming financial institutions such as Rappi. Uh, and it's also important and relevant to address these markets uh, because it's growing extremely fast. So just make sure to include debit and prepaid cards as part of uh, your strategy. And to uh, finish with the card payments chapter, wanted to quickly touch on Google Pay and Apple Pay real quick. They both operate in a similar way, enable, enabling users uh, who save their cards in their wallets to seamlessly check out on a mobile or desktop device. Um, and Google has a natural advantage here due to the simple fact that Android has a stronger penetration in LATAM. Apple Pay is starting to become more relevant in Brazil uh, and probably other markets will follow. Both are extremely good tools to reduce even more the friction during the checkout process. So it's also worth exploring this. Again, early days uh, in the region, uh, but it's worth considering. So we will move now into uh, the next chapter, which is alternative payment methods. In Latin America, uh, APMs can represent, depending on the market, between 40 to 50% of the payment mix. So it's extremely important to include them uh, as part of the strategy. Naturally, they tend to become uh, a bit less relevant in recurring payments. Uh, but still, we're going to see how to fully leverage uh, the power of alternative payment methods. This includes uh, cash uh, in a prepaid banner. Basically, uh, user uh, will top up their accounts either for a one or three or six months worth of subscription. Uh, and also with bank transfers, you can do uh, you can work out this prepaid model. Then with debit uh, with direct debit, sorry. Uh, which is a pull mechanism, uh, unlike the, the, the first prepaid option, which is a push mechanism. And uh, the third uh, family here is e-wallets. Uh, it works very similar uh, compared to direct debit. It's also a pull. And we're going to start with uh, prepaid solutions. So this is essentially again push payments using cash or bank transfers uh, and remember uh, cash is king in latin america you've probably heard this statement at least 30 times in the last year sorry uh, but for example boleto in brazil accounts for 25 percent of all the online transactions so you could just uh you, you can't really ignore this fact you need to leverage this So how's the customer experience uh, to pay for a subscription using cash? First, uh, users will go to a retail store. And they're going to ask the cashier, the clerk to top up their, their account. Uh, they're going to receive a ticket, a text message, or any other form with a PIN number. Uh, they're going to use that PIN number into their service uh to top up their the to confirm the, the the top up and get their balance uh and then they they're gonna get the confirmation for the transaction they will be able to use uh the balance within their service so here's uh an example uh of this use case essentially a cash top up solution for netflix uh in mexico what was the issue or the problem or the need here essentially reaching all the unbanked users in Mexico, uh, and also for users that maybe uh, have issues using their cards and they prefer cash. Um, so that's why Netflix decided to uh, launch this solution. Um, 
and again essentially the user will go to uh, any OXO store which is a, a pretty big retail in Mexico they have over 20,000 locations uh, so they will have to walk probably one or two block tops to get to the closest OXO store um, they will select from a fixed range of denominations, uh, 150 pesos, 300 pesos, 500 pesos, uh, depending on their plan or depending on how much money they will uh, want to top up. Um, they receive a pin on their mobile phone, just an SMS, they click on it uh, and that's it. They automatically redeem the, the this new pin uh, and they can keep enjoying uh, their service. This works for new users or for existing users. Um, so basically, uh, a good practice here is not only to offer multiple denominations, uh, so users can top up their accounts for, for longer than just one month, uh, but even better to offer discounts if they pay for, let's say, three or six months upfront. Um, because, you know, going through the hassle of every month going to an OXO store and topping up um, 100, 200, 300 uh, might be too much friction in the process. So if you create some incentives for them to actually do this process uh, once every three months or once every six months, it'll be even better. Moving on to direct debit. Um, historically, direct debit was used primarily to pay for utility bills, uh, and now we are starting to see uh, a new trend for uh, these mechanisms to to be used for e-commerce as well. Um, so, how does this this work? It's pretty simple. Users will sign up the first time, providing their uh, bank account details, uh, and you know, just a few clicks. And setting up the direct debit without leaving the the merchant's page, uh, and then every month the funds for the subscription will be pulled automatically from their account without any further interaction or approval. So it's pretty powerful for uh, subscriptions, obviously. The amount uh, that is getting pulled every month from from the account not necessarily need to be the same every month. Uh, so you can change uh, if they're buying a different product, different service, or you're just you know increasing uh, your prices. So it's also good to consider that. Now, uh, e-wallets they work like direct debit, but you're not necessarily pulling funds from a bank account, but instead it could be any digital wallet, uh, a challenger bank, a retailer or a right hailing company turn into a financial institution. Uh, and just like with direct debit, the only condition here is for users to have enough balance in their accounts. Uh, we are seeing players like Mercado Pago, PacBank, PicPay, uh, Wala, Rappi, uh, and so many more. They're again popping up every day uh, and starting to gain popularity in the market. So it's also uh, a good alternative to consider, again, beyond uh the traditional cards uh processing and uh before wrapping up wanted to quickly talk about pix which is the new real-time payment system that will launch in brazil later this year this is absolutely a game changer uh it will work like upi for those of you who are uh, familiar with the real-time payment system in india it would allow both individuals and companies to send and receive payments in real time 24-7. Uh, and the use cases for recurring subscriptions or any other model are just countless. Uh, as a payments geek, I'm particularly excited about this. This protocol or infrastructure uh, will allow payments not only for banks, but also for every other financial institution that uh, has registered with PIX. Um, and I believe this will just create a ripple effect with more and more use cases popping up and enabling new opportunities for the market. And to wrap it up, 
quick recap on the main topics uh, that we covered today for recurring payments in Latin America. Number one, remember, Latin America is not a single country, it's a whole region. So always consider the nuances for each country and each payment method. Make sure to rely on data to maximize your conversion. Um, do not settle for one acquirer only, you deserve better. Make sure to leverage the full spectrum of the payment mix, uh, credit, debit, alternative payment methods, and look for creative ways to always reduce the friction in your checkout. Uh, as an example, uh, with Google Pay and Apple Pay. Um, Josh, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation on recurring payments and the Latin America regions. Uh, the first question, can you explain the relationship between recurring payments and installments and explain, aren't they kind of the opposite uh, type of payment? Thank you. Uh, the truth is that they are not. For recurring payments, it's the merchant controlling the billing. They simply trigger a monthly or whatever cadence they choose uh, and get their money after the user pays. And with installments, they have the option to get all the money up front and simply move the risk to the issuing bank. It becomes uh, a more predictable revenue for the merchant. They get a longer commitment and lower churn from their users. Uh, and then from a consumer standpoint, oftentimes paying with installments might be even more beneficial than paying a monthly subscription, especially in markets like Argentina with a crazy high devaluation. Uh, merchants will be typically increasing the prices in local currency to keep the same revenues in US dollars. So for the, for the consumer, uh, securing a price up front in the local currency will also be convenient. All right, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple questions about um, zero dollar auth. So the first one, does the zero dollar auth failure in LATAM only apply to local acquiring? The the answer is uh, no. Uh, so in some cases, it might be a limitation on the local acquirers, uh, but in some other cases, it might be on the issuing bank directly. So even if you uh, send the zero dollar off through an international acquirer, you might still get uh, a high rate of uh, rejections or declines uh, because the issuer is actually the one uh, rejecting it. Okay. And then the second auth question, is there any workaround to the zero dollar auth in countries such as Colombia where the dual model is not enabled? Yes, uh, there is a workaround and actually that's what we do at DLOCO is to do a fake dual message. Meaning when we get an authorization, uh, we translate that into a sale or capture. Uh, and then, for example, if we get a void, we will just issue a refund instead. So basically what we do is we map the operations accordingly. Um, we add this layer of technology uh, to try to compensate the lack of certain features in the market. All right, let's see. We're getting quite a few questions in the question bar, so uh, don't mind if i take a little bit of time trying to read through these absolutely uh, okay so the next one can you elaborate more on descriptor issues yes absolutely uh let me see if we can go back to the slide real quick Yeah, it's fine. Um, so descriptors uh, might be also limited 
uh, by the local acquirers. Uh, in some cases, like in Brazil with uh, a more mature market, um, you will have uh, flexibility and you will be able to actually do uh, a per transaction uh, descriptor, meaning a fully dynamic descriptor where you can actually uh, customize it based on a transaction uh, basis. Uh, and in some other cases, it will be on an account level. So if you have, for example, multiple uh, business lines uh, within the same merchant, you may have to open different merchant IDs uh, or merchant accounts to have uh, one descriptor for each of these business units. Uh, in some cases, uh, regulation will also uh, force the payment facilitators or the sub acquirers uh, to be present in the descriptor. Uh, for D local, for example, it could be something like DL star and then the merchant's name. Um, so again, it really depends on on each market. Uh, uh, and, and, and the expectation is for every market to eventually get to uh, somewhere similar to the situation in Brazil today. So essentially where you can do a fully dynamic descriptor, but that's not the case uh, today. All right, great. The next question, why is the payment infrastructure so variable in LATAM? Uh, so I guess there are quite a few different reasons here. Regulations are different. Uh, local players, local acquirers, issuing banks are different. Uh, not every market, as I was saying, is equally mature. Uh, technology is different. In Chile, for example, there's still only one acquirer, whereas in Brazil, where you know the market was open almost 10 years ago, uh, there are multiple acquirers. So I guess the, the, the nuances uh, are created based on the evolution of each market. Uh, but again, we are seeing trends uh, that are in a way making every market follow a very similar path, uh, improving the technology, making sure all the features, you know, all the standard features are available, such as uh, dual messaging, uh, $0 authorization, uh, dynamic descriptor and so on and so forth. All right, great. What is your view about the future of Boletos in Brazil? Um, I think Boletos are still going to be extremely relevant, uh, both in the physical world and, and for e-commerce as well. Um, I see that PIX will probably uh gain some of that territory uh could even i could even see a, a scenario where uh someone will top up their account using boleto and then using pix to transfer money or to pay for a service or product uh so i don't see boleto going anywhere anytime soon uh if anything i see the boleto infrastructure getting better and better getting faster confirmation times, uh, getting better features. Um, yeah, that's that's my view. All right. And along those same lines, as you mentioned, uh, PIX, do you know if the PIX system will allow international transfers into Brazil or if it is only for domestic payments? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but I think it will be for domestic transactions solely. Uh, so any, again, uh, financial institution registered locally in Brazil uh, with local regulators and, and central bank will be able to operate under this framework. Uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, it won't be available for, uh, for companies that are not in the market. However, you can always rely on uh, PSPs or uh, any registered uh, company in Brazil to to leverage their licensing or their technology. So not necessarily having a local entity will be required uh, to register or to use it. Okay. 
For the prepaid model with cash, can the merchant typically choose the subscription plan alternatives to show the user? Yes, uh, there's a lot of flexibility around that. It's just, uh, you know, from, from a payment standpoint, it's just making sure the, the infrastructure is there. Uh, in the Yoxo example, making sure the, the technology is working, the notifications are working, uh, and users can go and, and, and select their service within the, the OXO system. Uh, but then there's flexibility in terms of the denominations you can offer uh, or the extension of the plan you want to offer. That's, that's more on the merchant side, yes. All right. In countries like Argentina, how do we protect those uh, from devaluations? I'm not sure I fully understood the the, the question, uh, yeah. but but yes, I mean uh, there's uh, as I was mentioning earlier, there's a crazy high devaluation in Argentina and and in other countries of Latin America as well. Um, so uh, strategies with pricing uh, in 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 local currency to protect you know, the, the users and the consumers uh, from, from this devaluation is key. And one mechanism uh, that I already mentioned is using installments. Uh, with installments, uh, users can make sure they will be charged the same amount in local currency every month, no, ma no matter what happens. Um, and then uh, for the merchant, they, they get their money upfront uh, in US dollar, assuming you know the the local model, uh, the the local approach. Uh, so that's probably one uh, way to protect both ends uh, for for these situations. Okay, great. What are the merchant requirements for enabling cash top up options such as OXO and Boleto? i.e. how enable the UX part getting the PIN and or the SIM? Good question. Uh, there are many layers, obviously, to, to, to that uh, question. Uh, first is finding the right partner uh, locally, uh, making sure they have the right technology uh, to enable that, uh, making sure the model enables uh, to uh, to operate with, uh, you know, the most popular cash pay methods, uh, making sure you are using the latest versions of their APIs, both for OXO, for Boleto, uh, you're partnering up with uh, with the right uh, banks. Uh, so uh, I see many layers. Uh, and then obviously, uh, I'm biased, but solutions like the local or any other PSP uh, might be a, a fast and convenient way to get access to all of these different tools. All right, the next question. As 3DS is mandatory in Brazil for debit cards, how does it work with recurring transactions? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, 3DS, as, as we discussed, uh, it's mandatory for debit cards only in Brazil, not for credit cards. So there's no issue with uh, credit cards. Uh, typically, there's no issue outside of Brazil because uh, 3DS penetration is not significant. And then for debit cards in, in Brazil, um, it will have to be a matter of uh, understanding the requirements with the acquirers you're working with and the issuers, uh, the main issuers at least, uh, to make sure the model is aligned with uh, a recurring subscription model. All right, great. All right, here's a very uh, long one. In Costa Rica, the central bank developed a platform called SINPE, which is basically a platform that controls all the services for transferring money, while the financial institutions and financial entities adhere to. What is your perception of having a public institution controlling this? The way I see it, it uniforms different procedures, but also can be challenging for new and modern methods, such as Apple Pay and Google Pay. 
to be honest, uh, I am not that familiar with the specifics uh, of this method. So uh, I suggest uh, the person uh, who asked this to to contact me privately, and we can probably have a uh, a more educated conversation because uh, I, I don't have enough background for this, to be honest. Okay. Uh, but but to go back to to the previous question um, about uh, debit cards in brazil and 3ds um obviously it's going to be tricky for subscriptions uh so one alternative could be to use direct debit instead we were talking about direct debit uh where the user will just you know sign up the first time provide their uh, bank account information the first time agree to terms and conditions only the first time and then it's automatically uh pulling funds from their account every month so that's a very good alternative to um uh, to uh, uh, basically debit cards in Brazil. Another right. alternative will be for, you know, as I was saying, big merchants to get waivers uh, from each of the issuing banks so they can process without 3DS or maybe just authenticating the first transaction but not the recurring transactions. Um, those are some of the things that I've seen in the market. All right. Could you give us a high level overview on recurring payments in Mexico? And what are some of the main challenges that you oversee, would oversee? Sure. Um, so both credit cards and debit cards are extremely relevant. Uh, most of the credit cards will be uh, enabled both uh, through the local rails and the international rails. Uh, debit cards uh, will perform usually better uh, going locally uh, using the local rails, uh, the local switches and the local acquirers. Uh, so that's uh, something to consider. Um, 3DS is typically not uh, widely adopted, so it's not going to be uh, a blocker or a challenge there. Um, complementing cash, uh, complementing cards with cash in Mexico is key. Uh, basically, the, the use case we were discussing for uh, for Netflix with UXO, uh, that's extremely relevant because if you go with carts only, you're missing out on a big portion of the market. So um, that's that's uh, pretty much how I see uh, a complete strategy for recurring in, in Mexico. Okay, great. Does DLocal support G Pay, I'm guessing Google Pay. Yes, we do. All right. Can you explain what a zero dollar auth is? Sure. Um, so it's a mechanism basically to verify cards. Uh, you send an authorization with a zero dollar value uh, to your processor, to your PSP or to your acquirer that will go to the issuing bank. Uh, and basically, if it's a valid card, it will get uh, accepted, otherwise it will get rejected. Um, so it's a very popular mechanism to use uh, for subscriptions when you want to, for example, offer a free trial, uh, you know, something like a week or two weeks uh, of, of, of a free trial. Uh, you verify, you validate the card before uh, before actually charging the user uh, throughout this one or two weeks period, and then you uh, eventually uh, start charging the user. So it's just a simple mechanism to validate the card. And as I was saying in Latin America, uh, the the issue is around the specific amount. So zero is uh, the issue, and there are many workarounds uh, for this, basically uh, sending higher amounts. Uh, we've done some research in, in every single market uh, with the different acquirers and different uh, issuers. So we know what's the minimum amount uh, that we can send in order to, to verify the card um, uh, and still make you know, all the players in the chain, meaning the, the acquirer and the issuer, feel comfortable. Great. 
All right, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. What is a good strategy to approach retries for failed credit or debit card payments for subscriptions? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, a few different things that we typically see. The first one is splitting out um, the first tries and the retries in different periods and in different batches throughout the day. Uh, so you can clearly differentiate all the good traffic from the bad traffic. In some cases, you might want to consider also opening up different merchant accounts uh, and leave all the good traffic, basically the, the first tries in one merchant account and all the bad traffic, all the retries in a different merchant account. Uh, it's going to be even easier to uh, measure performance, conversions and everything. Um, so that's, that's one strategy. Also, uh, recycling, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, making sure you are retrying enough times, uh, but not uh, too many times. Uh, there are rules from, from both uh, Visa and MasterCard on how many times you are supposed to retry the same transaction. So you, you will want to make sure to uh, keep under those, uh, those rules. Uh, and at the same time, uh, always have a customer-centric approach, meaning you don't want to wait until uh, the date where the where uh, the expiration is approaching to 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 actually do the the, the first try or the retry, because uh, you may end up uh, terminating the service for the user, uh, and it might be a, a transaction that can still be saved. Uh, so that's that's on the cards uh, side of it. And then also something that we've seen is retrying the transactions. Uh, you know, after you, you tried for several times and you're still getting declines, uh, fallbacking this transaction to an alternative pay method, meaning you are getting, uh, you know, over and over again, the same not sufficient funds message uh, from your processor. So at some point you decide to uh, issue a OXO voucher or a boleto uh, and send that to the user instead so they can still pay for the service and you are essentially saving that subscription. Great. So you mentioned the Netflix case. Are physical gift cards involved? No. Uh, that, that's one of the uh, main advantages of this solution that I was describing uh because uh, oftentimes there will be a stock issue with the physical cards uh and even you know the distribution of physical cards uh is expensive uh so this is purely virtual uh you can uh imagine this solution works exactly like a physical card uh but it's a virtual card you never get the actual plastic the actual card but you just get an sms uh, with the PIN number, you can click on it and automatically redeem um, that, that credit. Great. What is the adoption rate of the card on file framework of Visa in LATAM countries? Is it required? We are starting to see some more adoption uh, in countries like Colombia, where you know we were discussing that there's no uh, dual message available uh, or no zero dollar off, we are starting to see COF card on file to become more popular. But I still uh, think it's uh, very early days uh, for the implementation of this feature, both on the acquirer side and the issuer in the issuer side. Okay. Can D-Local help in retrying uh, payments? Yes, uh, there are different strategies here. One strategy would be uh, to control the retrying mechanism on the merchant side. Uh, that, that's a good option. Another option will be to rely on D-Local or any other PSP to do the, the, the to manage the retrying logic. Uh, and even in some cases, um, what, what we do, we were talking about acquired redundancy. Uh, so we 
not only control the retrying logic, but also once we get the transaction, uh, we can determine what's the optimal route to send that transaction. Uh, are we going to send it to acquirer X or are we going to send it to this other acquirer? Uh, and then if we send it to the first acquirer and we got a soft decline, we can still chain that transaction and retry immediately in real time uh, through a different acquirer. So both uh, options can be handled by the local, yes, uh, or by the merchant. That depends on uh, on uh, the level of control that the merchant will want to have in the flow. All right, we will take one more question, and then we can uh, you can have any closing uh, remarks, uh, Michelle, and then we'll all, I will also have some closing remarks as well. So uh, the last question is the suggestion to use different MIDs for retires to provide issuers the ability to differentiate the merchant transactions or simply for internal reporting simplification? Yes, uh, so the, the, the former is correct. Uh, it's also very useful uh, and in some cases we've seen that issuers prefer that model as well where they can, on their side as well, differentiate uh, the good traffic from the bad traffic, meaning all the retries. Uh, the same transaction can be retried five, six, eight times a month. Uh, so obviously that will reduce the, the authorization rates uh, and that might trigger some alarms on the, on the issuer side. So if you're very clear with them on the strategy and you tell them this is gonna be first tries, uh, performance here should look very good. This is going to be only retries. Uh, you should expect a, a, a bad performance. Uh, and also issuers will tend to advise on, uh, you know, depending on their, on their customer base, uh, what's the best retrying logic, what's the best retrying cadence and mechanisms uh, to make sure you're optimizing. Great. Any closing remarks? Uh, not really, Josh. Uh, I think we pretty much covered everything. Uh, the, the main conclusion, again, it's uh, Latin America is a very complex and, and diverse region. So uh, taking uh, a strategy where uh, you consider all the nuances uh, by country and pay method is probably the best you can do. Um, and again, thank you very much for, uh, for hosting us today. Uh, and hopefully we'll be sharing some more insights uh, soon. Great. And if um, any other um, uh, questions from our attendees, should they just email you? Yes, uh, it's michelle at the local.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Michelle, uh, for your great presentation today. Thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. The webinar will be posted and available to MRC members in the Resource Center on the MRC website. Additionally, we have some great uh, Wednesday webinars coming up, so check those out and register. And, and again, thank you. Uh, sign up today. Go check out merchantriskcouncil.org. Thank you again, Michelle, and thank you everyone who attended. Have a great day. Thank you.